Hi, and welcome to Small Publishing in a Big Universe. I am your host, L.A. Jacob. Today's interview will be with J. Scott Coatsworth, an author of assorted paranormal and sci-fi books featuring gay characters. Coming from our sponsors this month, from Water Dragon Publishing, The True Sun by Vanessa McLaurin Ray, Angels Adrift, Book 5 in the Z-Tech Chronicles by Ryan Southwick, and The World's Shattered Shell by Lawrence Raphael Brothers. From Paper Angel Press, Dangerous Inspiration by Greg Stone. Due to the overwhelming response to their Dragon Gems program last year, Water Dragon Publishing is putting together a series of anthologies featuring works by new and exciting authors in the speculative fiction genre. The first in the series of Dragon Gems is being published this month, Dragon Gems Winter 2023. There are 15 assorted speculative fiction stories, from a touch of humor to a little horror, Urban fantasy and paranormal suspense. Look for more to come out quarterly. Dragon Gems Winter 2023 is available this month from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Smashwords, and other online booksellers. Or support your local independent bookstores by ordering it through Bookshop or IndieBound.org. For more information, visit their website at WaterDragonPublishing.com slash dragon dash gems dot com this is small publishing in a big universe and i am your host la jacob and i have with me here today j scott coatsworth who is an author and a member of the SFWA, also known as the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Association. He lives with his husband, Mark, in a yellow bungalow in Sacramento, California. And he was indoctrinated into the fantasy and sci-fi by his mom at the tender age of nine. He devoured her library, but as he grew up, he wondered where all the people like him were. He decided that if there weren't queer characters in his favorite genres, he would maybe make them to his own ends. So we'd like to welcome J. Scott Coatsworth. Hey, you can just call me Scott. Okay, Scott. J. Scott Coatsworth is my pretentious writer name. You are a very busy person in the community. <laughs> From what I understand, you're a very busy writer as well. Yeah, I wish I had more time for writing, but yeah, I, I get a lot accomplished in a little bit of time. I understand that for the community, you have put together something called liminal fiction. What exactly are you trying to do with it I realized a while ago that one of my big strengths is that I'm a community builder. I tend to try to bring groups of people together and make things with them. And I've always like been fascinated with uh, fantasy and science fiction. And so uh, when I had the chance to put together a community site for this, I kind of jumped at it. Uh, liminal fiction at its heart is what I call a discovery directory. So the idea behind it is you can go on Amazon and you can put in some keywords, but it's hard to really narrow down and find something that's a lot like the thing that you like to read. So with liminal fiction and a sister site, which is a Queer Romance Inc., we created these directories where we ask authors for a ton of information about their books. But then that lets us drill down and provide a lot of ways to find different books. So you can do the regular search if you want to. You can search by genre. You can search by trope or by subgenre. You can do a filter search and kind of combine all different kinds of things to look for that. If you want the lesbians on the moon book, you can do that. If you want werewolves and vampires on Mars, you can do that. I actually have a friend writing a werewolves and vampires book on uh, the moon that just came out. Anyway, so the idea was that you would be able to drill down and find exactly what you wanted in the site. It's also a Facebook group. And so I've been building the actual community itself there. And a lot of people get together to talk about daily discussion topics. They stop by on our Spec Fix Saturdays to talk about their newest releases for authors, that they're new, they're great news. So it's basically just supposed to be a way of bringing together a bunch of people in this, the SFF community. And it actually goes beyond that to a horror and paranormal as well, but for speculative fiction to bring a bunch of folks together. There are organizations like CIFWA, which are great. There are cons and things, but I found when I was writing in the romance field, there was a lot more connection and community there. 
than I've found online in the sci-fi world, at least in terms of like websites and in-groups and that kind of thing. I think it's a lot more direct, fan-based, fan-to-fan, con-based. Um, but I really wanted to build something different in terms of the web itself. That's why I the idea. And uh, Limfic was born actually during the pandemic, about uh, three months in, we launched it. It's been around for a little over two years now. Have you found it successful in what you've wanted it to be and do? It is. It's a little bit harder going than we had in the romance market, but we are pulling together folks. In fact, we just got our 400th author listed a couple of days ago. There's a kind of a critical mass that you have to hit to have enough stuff to interest people. And also we do a weekly newsletter where we put out new releases and reviews and things. You have to have enough people involved that you actually have stuff to do that with. So I think we're rapidly getting to that point. So yeah, I'm very happy with where it's at and where it's going. I hope that it continues to grow. Now, your other site is Queer Romancing. Romance Inc. is basically a mirror of liminal fiction in that it runs the same way, but it is for LGBTQ plus fiction, mostly romance fiction, but we also kind of broaden the remit on that to allow anything that's got a queer romance and LGBTQ romance or relationship in it. It's a very similar site. It's also a discovery directory, but focused on that particular market. I just wanted to get everything out for you. <laughs> oh, there's about 20 other websites we run, but we don't have to talk about all of them today. Let's put on your author's hat. How many books do you have out well, it depends on how you define book. So if you define book as novel, I'm to eight. And I've got uh, three more actually that uh, Water Dragon is going to be putting out over the next year and a half. So it's basically two trilogies, a third trilogy coming. And then there are two standalone books. Drop Knots will be, this is my next thing to work on the sequel for. So it will eventually also be a trilogy. And I've got another nine novellas published currently. And then beyond that, probably I've published around 20, 25 short stories, of which about 16 are available through uh, two collections that I have. So Overall published works, I'm in the neighborhood of, I'd say, 40 at this point. How long did it take you to get this far? So I've been writing my whole life, but I didn't get serious until uh, 2014. I'd kind of started and stopped and started and stopped. And I wrote a novel back in the 90s that went out to a bunch of publishers, and every single one of them rejected it and stalled me out. I was working on uh, writing again, and we had a tragedy in our family. And I remarked to my husband that I'd just gotten started again, and things were going good, and this had to happen. And he looked at me and said, you know, the only one stopping you from writing is you. If you want to write, mm-hmm. write. And it was like this clarion wake up call. So I just buckled down and with his blessing, just started to really do it. So in 2014, I got my first two novellas published, sold a couple short stories. My first novel came out, I think it was 2017. That would have been Sky Thane. And I did this insane thing where I was working on two different sci fi trilogies at the same time. And so I wrote one and got it published in the first half of the year. And then the other one, the first one got it published in the second half of the year. And I did that for three years until both trilogies were out. But wow. they were, I didn't know it at the time until I got partly into them, but they were related. One was in maybe 150 years from now, and one was about 1500 years from now. But they're in the same universe, and there's a connection between the two. So doing that way, it kind of let me, especially in the last books, make some connections between them, some Easter eggs that are in there that kind of actually do connect them if you're reading both. I would think that if you're doing it both at the same time, you would have made some unconscious connections with them. So your mom was a sci-fi nut. Still is, still is, yeah. She was a science fiction book club member, and she had these two huge bookshelves in that what we call our spare room. And there were other books there too, but there were two or three shelves that were devoted to science fiction and fantasy. And she had the Dragon Riders of Pern, and she had Foundation Asimov's books. She had just a bunch of things, the kind of the classics of the genre at the time. This was back in the 70s. And I just started out with Lord of the Rings when I was in second or third grade, read the whole into third grade. Yeah. When Boromir died in the two towers, cried for days. So I went through everything that she had in her shelf, just devoured Mm -hmm. it. It's good and bad. It gave me a real grounding in that era. But as a writer, writing has changed so much and the genre has changed so much. I have to be careful in drawing on that while at the same time, not making it sound too much like that era when I write. Mm -hmm. The writing was just different back then. It was mostly straight, older, white men writing it. There was there were a lot of assumptions that went into the writing that in, in the characters and characterization. And it was amazing for its time, but it's so different than what's being written now. So it's important mm-hmm. to have gotten back into reading after a long reading drought over the last three years. It's fascinating to see kind of what's being written now. What's your most recent book? The most recent book is Drop Knot. It actually ties in with the idea behind the Stark Divide. That was the one, the book that I wrote back in the 90s was, was actually called The Shore of the Sea. The idea behind it was a generation ship where it was difficult to tell that it was sci-fi because the world inside was basically medieval at that point. It was like a fantasy. And when I came back to writing in 2014, I wanted to do something with that. So I thought, why don't I go back and figure out what the origin story is for that world? How did it start? When did it start? How did it get to where it is? 
And so I wrote The Stark Divide. It's, it's actually three different pieces, like three novellas that come together as one novel, each separated by about 20 years. And when I went to start a new project a couple of years ago, I had basically destroyed the earth in The Stark Divide, which I've done a couple of times. And I thought, what if not everybody's dead? What if somebody's still there? And where would that be? And that idea had come up in that trilogy because I had had them at one point get a signal from Earth, but nobody knew what it was or who it was from. And so that one little piece, that little line in the story took me back to write this new story about, yes, there was a base on the moon and the base on the moon survived and actually thrived, but they are such a small population that they know at any point there could be an asteroid strike or plague or something or something else could happen that could take out basically all that they know is left of mankind. And so they need to get back to Earth now that Earth, after 120 years, is starting to kind of settle back down. And so drop knots refers to the astronauts, essentially, but they're dropping back to Earth and trying to find out what's going on down there and set up a, a base to begin the migration. So it's one of those elevator pitch things. It's kind of like the 400 meets the expanse, but mm -hmm. more hopeful because most mm -hmm. everything I write has elements of hope in it. And you said that's going to eventually be a trilogy. Yeah. So the next one is Core Divers, and it has to do with something hidden on the moon. And so I'm kind of letting that percolate while I'm finishing up the editing on my current trilogy. And then I haven't figured out what the third one is yet. But yeah, that'll be a, a trilogy ultimately. I'm assuming you write mostly in science fiction, fantasy, and romance. Yeah. My overall thing is hope punk. So it's basically fiction, but most of it goes in science fiction, fantasy. I do a bit of sci fantasy. So my Sky Thane one has winged men and there's a lot of science fiction background to it, but it's again, kind of got a fantasy feel to it. The Stark Divide starts out as kind of a hard sci-fi. And then that Ariadne Cycle trilogy kind of moves over closer and closer to fantasy as you go through it. And one of my plans is to write that middle one between the two series that will kind of be the first book I ever wrote and finished and sub submitted that never got published, mm -hmm. just started over from scratch, but that middle time. And that's going to be mostly a fantasy feel. I got my start in romance because that was where I was able to find places that would accept my work. And even then, most of my romance, when it's male, male romance, most of it has sci-fi or fantasy or paranormal in it because I have a hard time writing straight ahead, guy meets guy. Contemporary. My show and tell example of that is Wonderland. I oh, was yeah. asked to write a novella or short story for a collection and it was supposed to be a Christmas story. And so, of course, I had to write a Christmas post-apocalyptic zombie story. And it's the last two guys alive on Earth as far as they know and they meet and one of them has OCD and it's what they go through to kind of figure each other out. And But yeah, so I have to have that extra little something in most of what I write. There's a couple that I've written that are just pretty much straight ahead contemporary. What genre would you like to try? That's a good question. I've been thinking about that. I've written fantasy, but most of my fantasy, again, is sci-fi adjacent. So one of them is a climate change set in San Francisco. So it's kind of an urban fantasy post-apocalyptic. One of my fantasies was just a fast forward time with a references to Faye. I'd like to do an actual all out epic fantasy at some point, probably a trilogy. Something that just is fully fantasy and not dipping into the sci-fi well. They really play in that side of things because I've, I really love the mix of the two. But I think it'd just be fun to do one that, that's straight on magic and just be able to screw around with the way the world works and reality and everything in ways that, as a sci-fi writer, you really, even if you don't disclose everything, you've got to have some kind of idea in mind how it works. Do you use a small publisher or do you self-publish? So I started out with a small publisher. I actually had four or five of them at one point that had done my works. I submitted different places for things. I've left most of them at this point. Some of them have left me. Some of them just gone out of business. But I'm still with Mr. Corner Books, which is a great little publisher of LGBTQ fiction. They do romance, but they also stray over into the more the genre side of things. So I've got still four or five novellas with them and short stories. But then everything else up to this point, I've done myself since 2019. I re-released all my novels, um, re-released my novellas, put out a couple new things. I am actually trying to experiment with Water Dragon now. When I broke my arm, it was the day before Baycon. And this was the first con I planned to go to for three years. We flew off my bike, flew 15 feet and slammed into the ground on my shoulder. It didn't actually hurt. It was just my, my arm just wouldn't move. And I was so distraught because I thought I'm not going to be able to go. I didn't know it was broken or not, but I'm, I'm not going to be able to go. I, but the doctor in the emergency room, he said, you know, it, it looks like it's broken. You're probably going to have to have surgery, but that's going to be a couple of weeks. If you can handle the pain, it, you're not going to hurt it anymore. Just keep it in the sling and you can go. So we did this crazy thing and went to a convention the day after I broke my arm and we're there for four days. And because of the break, I could type with one hand or I could, you know, voice to text, which is imperfect. 
but it just hit me how I've, I've been working on this trilogy and I tried getting it to an agent, the first book at one point, and I've been working on it for over two years. And I really just want to get it done because I want to move on to something new. I haven't written anything new since I finished the third book last year. So I ran into Stephen at the Water Dragon table, and we got to talking a bit about Sifwa and about science fiction and publishing and things. I was thinking about it and thought, you know, I, what I haven't tried is really working actively with a small publisher on the sci-fi side, the spec fix side. And I really like what he's doing here. And so I'll check with him and see if he wants to look at it. And if he's interested in it, we'll go from there. So I sent him the first book and he had the editor look at it and they really liked it a lot. They said, there's a few issues that we want you to fix if we take you on, but we'd like to do it. And I said, yeah, that's fine. And so we're going to go ahead and try this out for this trilogy. So long answer short, I'm still self-publishing and I still I'll probably do core divers on my own since I've self-published the first one. But I also want to try out this. It's a having a publisher, but it's an, also in a way it's kind of a partnership to try to make things work as well um, that I might not do if I was just handing it off to any publisher. I'm really excited to see how that goes. When do you plan on getting the first book out? It's titled The Dragon Eater. I sent that in about a month and a half ago, and I'm waiting for edits. The tentative plan is to do them March, October, March, I think it is. So, so six months apart, each one. And we want to leave enough time because if, if you really want to get reviews in the trades, you have to have actual physical books ready. And so my plan is, even if it takes a little longer, to get to that point, get the books out to the trades. And then if we have to move the date back a little bit, it moves back. But it should be in spring and then fall and spring. You can get a hold of him through limfic, L-I-M-F-I-C dot com or Queer Romance Inc, I-N-K, all one word, dot com. <laughs> Paper Angel Press presents author Greg Stone with his novel, Dangerous Inspiration, detective-turned-novelist Ronan Mazzini has different perceptions because of a condition called synesthesia. He transforms sounds into colors. These visions give him unusual insights into solving cases. These visions give him unusual insights that help him solve cases. So when a collection of eccentric and possibly violent creative people come together at an elite artist's colony in rural Vermont, murders occur in rapid succession and suspicion falls on everyone as Mazzini unearths the founding family's secrets. Dangerous Inspiration is available this month from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Smashwords, and other online booksellers. Or support your local independent bookstores by ordering it through bookshop.org or indiebound.org. For more information, visit their website at paperangelpress.com. Thanks again to our guest. We plan on publishing new episodes every second Wednesday of the month. Watch for new episodes around that time. Theme music is provided by Melody Loops. Other music is from assorted free music websites found on the internet. If you want to know more about small publishing in a big universe, visit our website at spbu-podcast.com. Tweet us at spbu-podcast and like us on Facebook at spbu-podcast. This podcast was recorded and edited by L.A. Jacob. Executive producer is Stephen Radecki. This month's episode was sponsored by Paper Angel Press and its imprints, Water Dragon Publishing, and Unruly Voices. You can hear our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music, and most of your favorite podcast services. Visit our marketplace for more information about books that are mentioned on this podcast. Thanks very much for listening, and talk to you soon. 